It is such a blessing to have you here each week from now on. It's so nice. I didn't know of this arrangement, uh, and I just said that by faith. How about every other week? Uh, thank you, Pastor Daniil, Pastor Clark. Thank you, my brother. I want to give you a hug. You're such a blessing, such a godly man. We're so glad that God brought you and your lovely wife to uh, Lincoln, and we're all blessed by that. So uh, you've just been a joy to get to know over time. And I, I don't know, is, is this guy over here somehow part of the choir? What, what is he tagging along here for today? Buell Fogg, ladies and gentlemen. Buell Fogg, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, Buell, you, you deserve some highlighting wherever you go. Well, well, I mean, you highlight your hair. I just thought that you might, you know, deserve some highlighting. <laughs> <laughs> and I need my hair back. Give that back. <laughs> Buell and I, we, I can tell stories, but so can he. But he is such a godly man and influence for the college and for our young people. He is a Jesus machine. <laughs> and he just pours out Jesus. And I, I love this guy. So thank you for how you have uplifted Christ throughout the years. And it, it's a, a privilege to have you, have you all. Uh, I'm going to uh, do a little disclaimer first. We'll be gone next Sabbath. As you've heard, we're going to visit Maria's uh, parents in Michigan. And uh, uh, that's a very important uh, visit, along with some other uh, activities that we'll be doing. But uh, so this is going to be kind of a pre-Thanksgiving appetizer. Please turn to Psalm 145. Psalm 145, and next week, Jerry Connell, who many of you know, will be speaking uh, here. But please turn to Psalm 145, and uh, I've got to tell you, well, on your way to the psalm, let me first ask, how many here consider themselves to be a fan of something? A fan of something. All right. What do you, tell me, what are you fans of? What kinds of things? Music. Music. All right, well, that's apropos, right? What else? A fan of Jesus. A fan of Jesus. That's the best. That's mejor. All right. What are you a fan of? Be beans in the garden? <laughs> a bees and gardening. All right. I'm a fan of the hearing aids that I'm going to be getting soon. Okay. We can be fans of all kinds of things. Hobbies, interests, uh, uh, lifestyles, uh, different things, sports teams. Some people are even, can you believe this? Some people are even fans of jumping out of airplanes. How fanatical can you get, huh? <laughs> Jameson, <laughs> how fanatical can you get? No, that's great, that's great. It has its ups and downs, but it's good. All right. <laughs> Now, and, and by the way, this past summer, I learned that Daniil, Pastor Clark here, is a huge fan of Shark Week on the Discovery Channel. I learned that. He's actually so into it that when he watches it, he fills his living room with sand. He does. And not only that, he gets so scared, he puts on shark repellent just to make sure he stays safe. We're going to watch it together this coming year. That's going to be great. All right. Now, there's nothing wrong with some good-natured interest and passions, is there? But right up front, I want to tell you, the main idea of Psalm 145 is this. If you're captivated with God as your King and Savior, you will be fanatical about praising Him. Amen. That's it. You will be fanatical about praising Him. In fact... Get this, this psalm does not contain a single petition or request. There are no calls for help or cries for mercy. It is a psalm of praise from start to finish. In fact, it's hard to believe, but of all 150 psalms, I know you won't believe me, but this is the only one that has the title, A Psalm of Praise. I did not know that until I researched for this week. 
Old Testament believers were so influenced by this psalm that they began calling the entire collection of psalms the book of praises. And the ancient New Testament church in the early centuries would recite this psalm over every midday meal. It was huge to them. So let's take a look. Just by way of introduction, let's look at the first three verses. I will extol you, my God, O King, David says, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised, and his greatness is what in your version? That, that's what I have too. Most of, most of them say unsearchable. Wow, what does that mean? It says your greatness is unsearchable. What, what's he trying to say by that? His ways are, God is what? He's so, what was that? Oh, oh yeah, all, all powerful, omnipotent. Yeah, that's right. He is so unsearchable, so beyond us, uncontainable. Right? Inexpressible. We're going to talk about it. You just can't put them in a box. You want to get up here with me? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Bromiendo. Chiste. Chiste. ¿Cuál es tu nombre? Ana Maria. Ana Maria? Ah, well, you love Jesus. You are full of praises for him, aren't you? I, I could tell that. I could tell that. Why did someone take care of her for the rest of the sermon? Why would I speak here? No. <laughs> no, no, no. You can talk as much as you want. I love it. My wife's name is Maria, too. She's right behind you. Yeah, yeah. She's watching you, so if you get out of hand, she'll tap you, okay? All right, let's continue. All right, so he is, his greatness is unsearchable. We cannot put him in a box, can we? It's just so great, so great. So I want to make a little confession here in preparing this sermon. I almost want to tell you this is not a sermon. Because, you know, in a sermon, you, you know, you're usually filled with, uh, you know, power and uh, unction and, uh, and, and praise lends itself, no doubt, to that. But as I considered more and more the greatness, the vastness, the indescribable greatness of God, I've got to tell you, for those who know me, you know this is something, I'm almost left speechless. I'm subdued. You know, I, I, the more I think about it, the less I have to say. And, and you go, well, you're a pastor, you're a preacher. You know, just, just preach it all out about God's greatness. The more I go, uh, 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 he's so great, I don't know what to say. And instead of going like this, which I often do and want to do and, and compelled to do, I crumble. Yeah. I crumble on my face realizing how unworthy I am to stand before you and describe this unsearchable, uncontainable, inexpressible God, how great are his ways, so past, so far beyond us, so past finding out, and yet they're tangible enough and real enough to benefit and bless and transform every one of us. So let's do our best. Though I'm subdued, Though it's not in me to preach at you, I could only lisp, as they say, after God's greatness in some modicum that will uh, hopefully bring honor to him. But just by a little more way of introduction, before we get into our formal study, I just want us to notice how often is David committed to praising God? Is it just on Sabbath? Is it just when life goes well or only when a prayer is answered? David says, I will praise him how often? Every day. Every day. Cada dia. He's not going to reserve his praise for special occasions. Each day he's alive is another day to praise the Lord. You know, several times in the psalm, David uh, says, I will. I will. You hear his deliberate his committedness to praising God. He's letting us know that praising God is the priority of his life. I will praise him. Nothing's going to get in my way today. I may have problems. Who knows? Another nation may rise up against me. There may be another revolt. Who knows? I may have failure in my life, but one thing I do, I'm going to praise him. 
I will. I will praise him. Imagine if we let nothing get in the way of praising God. God in our lives, what that would do for us. It would just uh, develop such a discipline of faith and praise. All right, you know, some can't help themselves with donuts, and David can't help him but to praise, and that's me with the donuts, by the way. It is holy food. It's Christian. All right. But David says, I will exalt you. I will. I can't help it. I will exalt you. By the way, what does that mean? Exalt means... Worship, right? It literally means, what does it literally mean? This is a hint. Yeah, to elevate, to lift high, right? To lift up. Jesus said when he is lifted up, he will what? All right, he'll draw to him. So if you want to be drawn to Jesus, then what do you do? You lift him up. You elevate him above every other attraction in your life. You know what I think our challenge is, at least for me? I lift Jesus up, but do I lift him up above every other attraction and pursuit in my life? We all lift him up. We all have so many pursuits and attractions, but do we elevate him more? than every other pursuit and attraction in our lives. And I got, thought of this analogy, praising God is like getting on an elevator. Because when you lift him up, then your own life soars higher. Isn't that true? It's like getting on an elevator. So you long for an experience that takes your soul to the very courts of heaven, well, step on to the elevator of God's praise, and it will take you all the way to the top. Amen for that. All right, you've got to wonder where all David's compulsion to praise the Lord was coming from. Blame it all on that little pronoun, my, M-Y, in verse 1. I will extol you, my God. You know what? You can't praise him unless he's your God. God, if he's just your parents' God, or your schools, or even the God of the church, you'll say, good for them. I'm glad they're so happy. But their God won't do you any good until you become uh, like Thomas and say, my Lord and my God. You see, David was king over Israel, but God was king over David. And he loved to let everyone know that so he couldn't contain um, his sense of how worthy God was of all that praise. Now, we're still in the introduction, but I don't want us to miss this. Please look at verse 4. Very curious uh, phrasing here. David says, one generation shall praise your works to another. Now, I've got to ask you, if you were describing what someone did, you were giving some factual historical account, you would say, I'd like to what? I'd like to tell you what they did. But David doesn't say say that. It's very unusual. He says, we need to praise his works to one another. It's very unusual phrasing. He's not saying tell them. He says, praise them. And what's the point, folks? If we only pass on to our children truths about God, they may get a good religious education, but they probably won't get God. Bible scholars, we've got to give our kids more than a good religious education. Listen, all the truths we share won't mean anything to them if they see it doesn't mean much to us. So express not just your truths, but your praises about God so that they'll come to see that he's relevant and real and worthy of worship for themselves. Not just truth, but praise his works to them. In our remaining time, since it's just impossible to cover the entire psalm, let's hone in on just three of the reasons David gave for praising God uh, that especially, I'll tell you, touched my heart this week. Let's go to verse 3. It says, Great is the Lord, and most worthy of praise, his greatness no one can fathom. 
fathom. Now this is interesting. The word fathom comes from an old English word, fadym, F-A-D-Y-M, which was the word for thread. That's where it comes from. Among other things, thread was used to measure. You want to measure something? You didn't have a, uh, uh, a ruler or something back then? Well, about how long is that? Well, just spread a piece of thread. That's about that long. <laughs> and now we know, all right? Well, that's what they do. And it came to mean, fathom came to mean to measure something, such as the depth of water under a boat to see if it was safe to pass. In light of that, how can we not ask, have you fathomed? Have you measured? Have you at least attempted to plumb the depths of his greatness? Now, folks, is it possible? Can we plumb the depths of his greatness? No, because how great and big and powerful and majestic and beyond comprehension is God to us. But let me say this. When we at least consider his greatness, the more we just measure it in our minds, the more we can't help but to worship him. Because that vastness, the greatness just... Uh, extends and extends. Let me ask you this. When's the last time you were overcome by a sense of awe at the greatness of God? Well, he just stopped you in your tracks. Now, we have moments of gratitude, right? And praise, we go, wow, God, you're so good. Thank you for that. And that's right. We should, right? And there are other times he stops you in your tracks and your mouth drops. And like we described earlier, you're compelled to crumble in adoration and speechlessness and say, wow, how great, how great is our God. There were times when I was a student missionary in Korea. I remember, uh, oh, I don't know how much to say, but I remember times of, of, of prayer and intense seeking after God. And it's not to say, look, at, uh, I hesitate to say that Wow, what a great spiritual man. I just want to tell you this part. That during those times where I said I'm going to be deliberate like David, I will, I will seek you. And I will focus on you. And I will consider the, the, your immeasurable greatness, your inexpressible greatness. I, that's what I referred to when I would crumble prostrate with my face down and the room would be filled with this holy presence the holy presence of God that was so real to me I was afraid to look up it's that experience it's that experience of the awesomeness of God and I know that could come in many forms and uh, that was an unusual experience but but I want that. I need that. And I'll tell you why I need that. And maybe you do too. A theoretical physicist wrote, awe gives you an existential shock. You realize that you are hardwired to be a little selfish, but you're also dependent on something bigger than yourself. But here's what I really like. He says, being enraptured is a way to remove the tyranny of the ego. What's, what's he saying? He's saying, pray, I'm going to apply it to the Christian life. In our context, praise lifts, elevates God, lifts him up to such an extent that we're no longer self-absorbed with our petty pursuits, are we, any longer? And we're so caught up in his greatness and goodness and tender mercies that, that we can't help but explode in praise and adoration of him, losing sight of self. He is lifted up. We're drawn to him. We're transformed. Love takes hold of our hearts, and we are changed. We're changed. So praise removes the tyranny of the, that self-absorption. You know that? Think of this. Uh, uh, how great is our God, how vast he is. In 2010, the brightest star ever found in the universe was discovered. 
It's interesting, not even a welder's helmet could protect your face from the brightness of this particular sun or star that they found. Listen to this. It's not twice as bright or even 10 times brighter. It's not a thousand or even a million times brighter. This star is 10 million times brighter than our sun. You imagine, <laughs> talk about, how many of you see my sunglasses? I, you know, you couldn't even step outside. If <laughs> the sun was that bright, how could anything be that bright? And yet, the Bible says God is a being who lives in what kind of light? In approachable light whom no one has seen or can see. That's why I tell you, the older I get, you know, it's hard to fight that fight of cynicism. The older you get, you say, well, I've, I've been there. I've seen that. Oh, yeah, I went through that. Yeah, I know what that's like. We need to fight cynicism. And I've got to tell you, considering God plummeting his depths helps us praise him for his greatness. And that, in turn, helps us realize only our creator God is big enough to elicit the level of wonder that leads to praise and forgetfulness of self. Only God is worthy of that. No wonder Paul speaks of the unfathomable riches of Christ. Well, along with God's inexpressible greatness, David also praises him for his inexhaustible resources. I love, always been Verse 15 has always been one of my favorite verses. David rejoices. He rejoices in verse 15 when he says, The eyes of all look expectantly to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Folks, the truth is, it's not that God is boring or irrelevant or can't take care of you, the truth is that we just don't want him to because he can. He can and he does. He satisfies every living thing. The scripture says, at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. In thy presence is a little bit of joy. Isn't that, isn't that great? The fullness of joy. So it's a lie. It's just a lie of the enemy that God can't satisfy. He opens his heart and he does fill us completely. Interesting, in ancient Greece, it was customary for peddlers who walked the streets with their wares to cry out, what do you lack? What do you lack? Isn't that interesting? That's neat. The idea was to rouse the people's curiosity so they could see if the peddler had something they needed or desired. God has exactly what you and I need because he's so great, there are no limits to his resources. They're inexhaustible. That's why Paul said, my God shall supply all your need according to his meager resources in Christ Jesus. Isn't that great? What? Riches in Christ Jesus. Great is the Lord. He's most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. You know, despite being a highly revered king and hero of the masses, David knew that only God is great. Great illustration of this. In 1715, King Louis XIV of France died. Anyone know what he called himself? He fashioned himself Louis the the great, right? Magnifico. His court was the most magnificent in all of Europe. He even planned his funeral to dramatize his greatness. His body was put in a golden coffin. Can you imagine? Golden coffin. And he left orders that the cathedral be dimly lit with only a special candle set above the coffin. Why? In God's house. He wanted to be the center of attention. Block out everything else. He wanted to be the center. Then, 
thousands waited in hushed silence, not knowing what was coming next. Then the presiding bishop obviously went off script when he slowly reached down, snuffed out the candle while saying as if to the king, only God is great. David would have shouted, hallelujah, amen. Well, David praises God for his inexpressible greatness, for his inexhaustible power to provide. But in verse 8, he praises God for his immeasurable grace. David sings, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great in loving kindness. The Lord is good to all and his mercies are over some of his works. Isn't that great? Someone's got a chance. It might be you. You know, I'm so glad for this. I'm so glad because knowing the sinner that I am, that I, if it didn't say all, I might have thought, oh no, it, it's probably you, but it's not me. No, but his mercy is over all, all. And not only that, verse 14 adds, the Lord helps all who fall. He raises up all who are bowed down. Have you ever fallen before? Have you ever failed God? Failed yourself, failed your family. I know I have. And when you do, what happens? You get bowed down. You become bowed down with guilt, with shame, with, with just wretched sorrow, with God, how did I turn against you again? In light of your goodness to me, how did I do it? And it's just amazing. David believes God is worthy of praise because he knows for himself how God delights in picking us up after we fall. What did he say? The Lord helps all who fall. Look at these uh, Bible examples. More than once, Abraham lied to important people, yet God called Abraham his what? His friend, right? Moses committed murder, but God used him to free a nation of people from slavery. David committed great sin, but instead of pulling away, David is later called a what? Man after God's own hearts. The question for you is, would you use people like this to make you look good? Imagine that. Would you give them the job of reflecting your glory? It's crazy, but God did. God chose these people to reflect his glory. Yes, yes, they turned back to God. They confessed God came back in, but he took these broken people who had fallen to such depths and gave them the job of reflecting his glory. And that's why David praises him for his immeasurable grace. On a more earthly level, I chose because I knew there were people representing the college at least. And uh, we do have some young adults, maybe some students here. Reminds me of a final exam that took place at Hannibal LaGrange College in Missouri not that long ago, 2002. Student Denise Bandeman walked into class for her final exam. Minutes before the professor arrived, everyone was cramming. The professor finally came, took a few minutes to review with the students. Most of it was familiar, except they kind of hiccuped when the professor began sharing things that absolutely no one remembered hearing in his lectures. Uh-oh, <laughs> the corporate uh-oh gasp went up. He didn't go over this. They were afraid. Then the professor sent cold chills up every student's spine when he said, look, folks, this is all in your textbook, and you're responsible for knowing it all on this exam. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, when it came time to turn over the exam and begin writing, the student I mentioned, Denise, later described her astonishment. I could not believe it, she said. Every answer on the test was filled in. Even my name was written on the exam in red ink. A wordless stir traveled like a wave over each student as they stared in shock at their completed exam. But here's the kicker. 
On the bottom of the last page of each test was this note from the professor. It read, all the answers on your test are correct. You will receive an A on the final exam. But the reason you pass the test is because the creator of the test took it for you. All the work you did in preparation did not help you get this A. <laughs> Talk about amazing grace. I looked it up, by the way. It is a Christian college. And if you're thinking of transferring, uh, you can see if this guy still teaches there. <laughs> but David says, you want to know what God looks like? Look at my God. He is gracious and compassionate. He's inexpressible in his greatness and immeasurable in his grace. You know, we began by saying that of all 150 psalms, this is the only one that has the title of, of uh, a psalm of praise. This is also the last psalm credited to King David, so perhaps he reserved this title for his last psalm to re-emphasize the fact that all our words should end in praise to God. Have you ever noticed that David often says terrible things at the beginning of his psalms? He's venting all the steam, you know, he's saying all, all kind of crazy things like may Buell pull the last remaining hair out of Pastor John's head. Uh, just terrible things, Buell. But by the end, what is he doing? He's praising God, and it's beautiful, and he's got it all out, and he's trusting him again. And that's reinforced by the last verse of this last psalm of David that says, My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name for how long? Forever and ever. It's as if forever isn't long enough. He has to add ever to forever. And the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation shows us that we are going to have all eternity to praise his name. You know, you get the feeling the temptation comes. You know what? I think that as time goes on in eternity, I'm going to go, what? We're going to worship again? We got to go, no, really? Didn't we just do that 800,000 million times? <laughs> what? Then for the last million years, and there's this temptation in our, our earthly sin-corrupted minds to think, isn't that going to grow a little old? But you know the truth? Since God is a God of, of inexpressible greatness, you, there's just no limit to his unfathomable goodness and greatness, not only will we never tire of praising him, we actually will only find more and more reason to praise him. It will only increase throughout the stretches of time. That blows my mind. Closing, stories told of an ancient kingdom whose king had just died and whose ambassadors were sent to chose, choose a successor. They had to make a choice between two twin infants that were related to the king. They found the little fellows fast asleep and looking at them carefully agreed this would be quite a difficult to decide. That is until they noticed a curious little difference between them. For as they lay there, one infant had his tiny fist closed tight while the other slept with his little hands wide open. Instantly, they chose the latter, and the story very properly concludes with the record that throughout his reign, he came to be known as the king with the open hand. This is one of the great truths about God. He is not a tight-fisted deity, but a God with an ever open hand. For our God is the greatest of all givers. So like David, we too can be filled with gratitude and praise for his inexpressible greatness, his inexhaustible resources, and his immeasurable grace. And if he has an open hand toward you, won't you open 
your heart, your mouth, and words, your entire life to daily expressing your gratitude and praise for him. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Thank you again, choir. It's such a blessing to have you here. Thank you for facilitating worship and praising him. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Loving Father, oh, I once read something like 23,000 breaths a day we take. Oh, can't we just use one of them for you to praise you? Not just one, more and more all the time because you're worthy of that. Father, help each one of us plumb the depths. Just make an attempt to recount how good you are, how great you are, how gracious you've been, so that our hearts can join David in saying, I will extol you, my God and my King. And now glory, to be, glory be to him whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory be to him from generation to generation in the church 
and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen.